Ready? Position good? Okay. All right. So when did you just fired your kiln on Monday, correct? Actually, I started unloading it on Monday. Okay. It takes, um, it takes me two days to load it, two days to fire it, and two days to cool it down. Uh -huh. So it's a week-long process wow. of firing it. Yeah. And is that part partially or all because you work in porcelain that it no, is? No, it's a... because I raw glaze. So I'm, I'm, I'm glazing the pots as I'm making them. So they all get glazed when they're leather hard, oh. which is the same as you would do for slip application uh -huh. on your work. So that's what that is. Bodhi. Interesting. Come here. It's Bodhi. Bodhi. Bodhi oh, he's going to stay with you. I know. Like... I know. <laughs> well, um, show us. Let's see, can we move in and look at what's in the kiln right now? I see you, yeah. you've left some pieces in there. Well, I'm just not finished unloading yet. Uh -huh. uh, the ones on the bottom are actually Cynthia's, and these these at the oh. back, I don't know if your camera's going to pick it up, but the larger, tall, the tall mm -hmm. pieces in the back, those are the newest things I'm making, the candelabra. I know, they're like, they take so those long to make. They take me six weeks to make. Wow. So, and my firing, you know, between making and firing, my cycles are about a month. So I have to start, if I, those I made actually last winter. When you say it takes you, how long did you say again? Uh, it takes me about four weeks of work to fill the kiln. Oh, I see, yeah. So but the candle opera itself is... Those take uh, six weeks. To six make. weeks. Yeah. And what is it that is involved that... It's because, it, it, uh, it's because of working in sections. Mm -hmm, so I'll mm -hmm. make the bottom section, then I throw the section off of that. So it just uh, takes a long time wow. for it to dry. And then that has to be leather hard for you to yeah. throw off. Yeah. So okay. it just takes a long time, and then all those attachments. So the whole piece has to stay right. the same consistency or an even consistency, and then the handles go on, right. and then the little things go on top of the handle. So it's just a long, involved and process. That glaze color is just scrumptious, which I see you use that an awful yeah. lot. What is the it's chemical a, that creates the copper? Oh, copper. Okay. That's just like your shirt on. Well, actually, kind this of. This is a little more turquoise. This is but more, it is turquoise, yeah. but this is this probably has a little cobalt in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but, you read yeah. colors in <laughs> terms of uh, composition of, of. Yeah. So the co uh, copper is an amazing uh, yeah. mineral for co a colorant because right. you get this fabulous turquoise, but it's also extremely volatile. Mm. So, or or another way of saying it is, it's like a fugitive. It likes to escape from where it is and land oh, on other things. Interesting. So this is actually a white glaze that I don't know if you can see the oh, pink, I totally the pink can. in there. And yeah. then there's a, there's pink on that mm -hmm. side and red. Mm -hmm. And then um, there's a little bit of turquoise in here. And that's because copper, you know, if you think about a copper roof, when it goes on, or copper pipes, they start red. That's right. what we call reduced copper, copper that's mm -hmm. not been exposed to mm -hmm. oxygen. And then when it gets exposed to oxygen, it turns that kind of uh, verdigris or turquoise. Right. And right. so it, it runs off all the pot. This has no uh, copper in it, this glaze. It just runs off these other pots and oh, lands and then, on that one. So then you get these wonderful surprises when yeah. you open up. You never really quite I never know. know. Are, are they ever disastrous, or are they oh, usually, yeah. yeah. Here, I'll show you a disaster. This glaze, some, something's changed in this glaze. Oh, interesting. Ooh, and it's got a big fat crack in the bottom, too. Ooh. <laughs> oh, it, it is disappointing because <laughs> watch out, it's so sharp. I know. Well, wow, I think, because this part is just, but yeah, even there, I feel. I'm still, it mm -hmm. just ran off of a lot of the pot. So mm -hmm. I, one of the chemical, this is the, the heartbreak of pottery. Yeah. I don't know if people really want to know about this. <laughs> oh, I think they do. <laughs> because then it shows how exceptional it is when it all comes out right. Yeah. You know? Well, it's pot, the, I mean, I think the interesting thing about potters and about pottery, one of the interesting things is that, um, potters seem to love a challenge. You have to kind of want, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think all people who are involved in crea creativity or mm -hmm. creative activities, people, they like to take risks. They like to jump off into unknown territory, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though it's extremely uncomfortable. And so when I look at this, when I look at this glaze, it doesn't make me discouraged. It makes me want to go right back into the studio, figure it out, and fill up that kiln and fire it again. Yeah. And I think that's a, a quality that potters share. 
But I also think mm -hmm. it's a quality that all people who are engaged in creativity mm -hmm. or creative activity it's the share. the creative problem solving aspect. And, yes. And plus you're birthing a new concept and, and if it didn't go well you want to, you want to, you can't sleep until you know that you've got it well, figured I, out. Yeah, well and yeah. I, you know it's like everything that comes out of the kiln. If I, once I get to a, p a place where I feel like um, those pieces are coming out really consistently and mm -hmm. I have control over it mm -hmm. and I have control over every part from the forming and throwing all the way through trimming and glazing and firing then I actually lose interest in it. Yeah, so and at it's that time point, for something it's new. It's time to quit. I know mm -hmm. it's time to stop making that form. Yeah. yeah. Show so. us some of the things over around the corner. That's okay. so lovely the way that's set up. Oh, I love your twinkle lights. <laughs> it, it's, the only way I can get lighting in here. Oh, but um, yeah. let's oh. see. This is my favorite one. I think this is my favorite one at the moment. This, uh -huh. this piece up here. Ooh. Um, just because it's it's again it's formed in sections. So right. it's this section and then this section is thrown on top of this section and mm -hmm. again here and here. Mm. And um, that's I don't. Here's here's another kind of example of that form. Mm -hmm. But this is where they started. Right. But this one is, that one is so crisp. Yes, it is. And the lines are so mm -hmm. um, strong. There's no blurriness in right. the direction that your eye is taking from here to here to here. Mm -hmm. um, it's so sculptural. Versus this, the proportions, you know, like this, mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. here is basically the same as this, which mm -hmm. is basically mm -hmm. almost the same as this. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that variation in the width and the, the proportion to the height that creates like yeah. something yeah. that's more dynamic. It really is. So that's it's my beautiful. current favorite. Beautiful. I can see why. I also like this this feeling of is, it, is this a picture? No, it's, it's a vase. vase. Okay. Yeah. I, I love the way it twists. I try to make all my work look like it's alive. Yeah. I'm really interested in um, movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. I want my work to make me feel happy, and part of that is that it looks like it's moving. Mm -hmm. And I, so, I sometimes think I watched too much Walt Disney when I was a child. <laughs> you know, those cartoons where oh, you're watching yeah. and the toaster jumps up and uh -huh. sprouts wings, and then it's suddenly dancing with the fork and the knife and the spoon and the teacup and saucer. Yeah. That's oh, what, yeah. That's what I, I want my pots to look like. Well, they, they do. <laughs> Don't you think? <sighs> so, the, and they, I think this is, this is kind of a... This is one of like the seminal pieces. Mm -hmm. This is a. It's beautiful. I call them dancing teapots. Mm -hmm. And um, so I st I actually started with these teapots many years ago, and then I made the mugs, even though that's mm -hmm. a different glaze color, to go with the teapots. And I call them a dancing teapot and a dancing mug. Nice. But the great thing about these techniques too, like for people who are interested in taking the classes mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. colorway is that um, all these techniques are really pretty easy mm. to learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have basic throwing skills. And so, so making something like this, although it looks complex, mm -hmm. once you know how to do it, it's really not complex at all. So people leave feeling they've gotten a new, new dimension to what they can do with their hawks when they find these new techniques yeah. that create movement. And, and yeah. prob another, another thing that you and I talked about with your workshop is you're going to touch on some of your surface yeah. um, technique. Uh -huh. um, you want to pull out some of your favorite. Uh, you have these beautiful. Well, they, this is this like, and this is this is a, even though this is the has the same lines, it's created differently. Mm -hmm. Like this, this is uh, fluting, what I call fluting, and um, so you can see it looks sort of like ruffles yeah. or fabric, and. These really kind of look like fabric too, but the line, the line quality is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And then um, this is what I would call stamping or embossing. Mm -hmm. And it's really, it's really, this is actually the simplest of the techniques. Um, you just, you can make up your own stamps, or you can find things that are stamps. 
and then you just in, I just inlay the glazes into them. Mm -hmm. But what interests me about all of these surfaces is that um, they're tactile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they work with color, but they're also really tactile. And I think that all potters are essentially tactile. We just find different ways of working mm -hmm. with, the, mm -hmm. with the medium. But you have to have a, a really great tactile sense. And so we're always looking for tactile pleasure. Oh, yeah. This just makes you want to... To touch yeah, it. Yeah, it yeah. does. Well, so they're good. very sensuous. That's great. And I love this one right here. It's got a very oh, different this? look. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's... I mean, I think that's... This, again, has the, the pink from the copper mm. that got picked up in the mm. film. Mm -hmm. I mean, I... I uh, is that a chino on that? This is a flashing slip. Okay. Yeah. Which is basically... A chino and a flashing slip are basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. They just... Um, either side of the 50-50 feldspar clay mark. So a flashing slip is, you know, has more clay than feldspar and a um, chino has more feldspar than clay, but they're basically using the same mm -hmm. reactivity. Yeah, well that, that's the great thing about um, any of these techniques is depending upon what, what you use on the surfaces and how your kiln is responding, you get really different, like these two pieces have a really different feeling to them. Absolutely. Even though they're made exactly the same way, mm. this one looks like it could be from your grandmother's vintage china cupboard, mm -hmm. and this one looks like it came out of a, a whimsical wood kiln. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you're doing with your stuff and how you're glazing it, you can could create completely different worlds. This, mm. this, I, this was... Um, that you have somewhere... Oh, yeah, that's I a, have a photograph of that yes. that you sent. That's beautiful. These were... These came from my grandmother's... I'm finally realizing where this stuff comes from. I inherited uh, what they call them cash pose to keep fruit in right. from my mother who had it from my grandmother, and it was sitting on my kitchen counter two winters ago or three winters ago, and I just kept looking and looking at it, and I thought... I can make that, nice. or some version of it. Nice. You know? And this so. is one. Can I hold it? Oh for yeah. You? This is one you just want to hold because <laughs> you're gonna look inside. Uh huh. And I just feel the weight of it. It's so elegant. It's also I sometimes it. I like when I'm in my, you know, like you look at your work and you look at your work and you see. First of all, you'll see something elegant, and then you'll see something completely inelegant. Like, <laughs> oh, there you go. I love that. <laughs> And so now these over here, are they, do they have slip or glaze on them right now? Well, they're all, they're all behind okay. you too. This is all um, ready to Step go in the kiln. Okay. This has, um, it's all glazed. So mm -hmm. I actually, it's bizarre, but I can tell because it's, a, there are various forms of gray, although there's some that are quite distinguishable, like that's a yellow. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But all these different grays, like here's a kind of a gray. Here's a kind of a gray. Right. Here's another kind of a gray. So, but since I'm working with these all the time, yeah. I know what glaze colors these are. Sure. Yeah. And when I'm actually when I'm working in the studio, um, I'll put the liner in first. Okay. Um, and the, some of the liners, because they're they have, are just white, they look so similar. I'll leave pieces of masking tape on the shelf for mm -hmm. myself and let me know what I've got mm -hmm. in each one, so that I don't get confused. So this mustard-colored glaze this right one, now, what will that, that fire? That is just like that, that cash okay. bow that we right. just had out. So yeah. that's the same as oh, this. Oh, nice. Um, it's, it's this glaze without the slip trail mm -hmm. under there. Yeah. Do you end up having signature, like do you end up formulating your glazes through the years so they're your signature glazes? Or do you just uh, change as you go along? Or do you get ideas from other people? A lot um, of questions I'm, I'm at really once. lucky in the sense that I get to be out there teaching a lot, which I really yeah. enjoy. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my favorite classes to teach is an eight week concentration class it's like an immersion class, and that happens at Penland. Uh -huh. And when I go up there, um, there's usually, it's usually I'll teach in the fall, so there's usually glaze buckets left from all the classes uh -huh. that have happened over the summer. And if they haven't been culled, I'll ask to keep back a lot of them that look like they might work. Mm -hmm. And then um, the first thing I do with the class is make lots and lots of test tiles, and I'll test every glaze on its own. And then every glaze, let's say I have 
glaze uh, a test tile of a series of A and B. So I'll put A over B, and then I'll also do B over A. So then I've got an exponential number of combinations, just even from 10 mm -hmm, glazes. Mm -hmm. And then because I get to be there for eight weeks, and we the turnover in terms of firing is really fast, I get to see a lot of results of a lot of glazes really mm -hmm. quickly, and then I'll, I'll cull from those glazes what I want. So that's where, you know, that piece that I said was um, my current favorite or that I think is my current best. Mm -hmm. That's where that white glaze that I showed you on mm -hmm. that basket, that's where mm -hmm. that came from. So I'll take glazes from other people and then through my use of them, I develop ownership of them. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I'm not a, a glaze chemist. Right. Um, what I'll do though is if I have a glaze and it's not working properly like that one that's running all over the shelves, I, I know enough now. Um, First of all, to consult with people who are smarter than me about it. Yeah. And then second of all, if I can't find those people, I do know enough to try to start experimenting yeah. with um, yeah. fixing it. You know, it's, it, once, you, once you get it, it's not complicated. It's really all the weird names that we have for this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like if you just have filler, melter, and glass former, you know, and those are the three things, and you know what the correct proportions should be, then it breaks it down. But it's when you start walking into a, a, a glaze room for the first time with all the chemicals, and it's this feldspar, and, um, mm -hmm. and you don't know what that mm -hmm. is, or mm -hmm. pot spar, mm -hmm. and soda spar, and silica, or silica and flint. You know, I mean, quartz, silica, and flint, it could be labeled any of them, and they're all the same. So when you mm -hmm. first walk into that room, you're like, your mind is blown. Mm -hmm. But it's really not that complicated. Yeah. <laughs> like anything else. Shh, it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for showing us your wonderful studio and work. And yeah. today you're having a tour. What's yeah, we're having this, the name of the tour? It's called the Tow River Arts Council okay. Studio Tour. And there's like over a hundred artists. Wow. And um, this is a great area to be mm -hmm. if you're a potter or any kind of craft artist because you're always seeing, there's so many amazing artists here that mm. um, it means that you're always looking at what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. And so you know if so-and-so up the road is pulling out new stuff out of their kiln, you're like, I have to be pulling new stuff out of mine, too, yeah. you know? You can't rest on yeah. rest on your laurels. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an That's incredibly good. creative energy atmosphere. Too. Yeah. Great energy to yeah. be able to always be around creative people. Very good, yeah. Well, thank you oh, so much. Mama, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, and thank you, and that's that. <laughs> I don't know how to do these things.